Welcome to Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I'm your host, Levi Strom. Transcripts of today's episode are brought to you thanks to a generous donation from Deborah Lumpkin's studio, sustainable Gyutaku artist in Maui, Hawaii. Thank you, Deborah. Additional funding provided by Jeannie Nosaro of Bee Haven Hill Farms in Mendocino, California. On today's episode, I speak with Medicine Box founder Brian Chaplin about sobriety and cannabis. I'm Brian Martell Chaplin, the founder of Medicine Box, um, a plant-based uh, therapeutics brand uh, in the Prop 64 uh, marketplace in California, and then as well as the uh, a national uh, direct to consumer model with exploring some of those mo- those minor cannabinoids uh, from the hemp plant. So products that have uh, less than uh, 0.3% THC, which we could probably talk all day on. Uh, launched that in 2020. Um, our mission at Medicine Box uh, is to uh, co-create interconnectedness in human health and happiness while harmonizing a relationship with Mother Earth. And uh, I've been working at Medicine Box, uh, working on it for uh, the better part of like five years, like coming all the way from the Prop 215 world. Uh, Before that, uh, I was a traditional market uh, farmer, a cultivator uh, like yourself, uh, starting in starting that illustrious career in 2009 and Uh, Oakland Mm. and I know a lot of your listeners are in the you know the California culture and uh, some people might know of Dutch Boy Studios which is um, in East Oakland so probably about a mile from the Fruitvale BART station and uh, yeah kind of like landed there with some friends um, when I was unemployed in 2009. 2009 yeah Amsterdam. Well, yeah, like right after like the the recession, I like I moved to San Francisco right off of the playa, like after Burning Man, mm-hmm. all partied out. My friends were like, "Dude, we're moving to San Francisco. Are you coming?" And I'm like, "Yeah, let's do it." Like, and basically just went to San Francisco, like had a room in Tahoe uh, where I was living, and and then uh, my. my uh, bartending career at the time fizzled out. I thought like the thousands of bars in San Francisco, I'll be able to get a job, no problem. And that was like, no one was hiring. It was like recession. And, right. Uh, I was on unemployment, like basically the, the guy on the couch. And I had a car, I had this Honda Elantra that my sister gave me this little four door like beater. And um, my friends were like, yo, we're going to Oakland. Like we need a ride you're not doing anything. you don't work you're not doing anything so we drove over to dutch boy studios i had no idea levi what was going on like i didn't know why they were going to oakland and i was just like along for the ride and um they get the tape measures out and they're measuring the space and it's like you know oh we'll put a room here and then it was like oh i know i know what they're doing i wasn't really like in that world, I was, you know, before that I was living in Tahoe and just in the food and beverage world and bartending and partying and, and doing my thing. But I, I knew it was kind of around, it was still pretty like, you know, secretive at that time. Sure. Like not Unless you were like really ingrained in a network or, or a click or circle. Um, yeah, people didn't, didn't talk have- about it. Yeah. People didn't talk about it. It was like, oh, what do you do? I'm a consultant. I'm a mm-hmm. music producer. I'm a construction. DJ. I'm a construction. <laughs> yeah. uh, everyone had their stories, but it's like, well, you guys, I never see you guys go to work and like you're always traveling to like Bali and Mexico and going to all these festivals and, and your, you know, buses and you seem to throw around a lot of money. Right. And so I was like, somewhat naive to it and then on the way back uh crossing the 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 bay bridge my friend mike and tim they're like well we need money to come up with the down the the lease and the 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 deposit and i was like 
driving and the Honda Elantra. I'm like, I have money. They're like, you don't have any money. You're unemployed. And I'm like, I have $60,000 of unused credit cards. Like at that time, uh, credit card companies were just like, here's more credit. Like remodel your kitchen for low, low APR, of like right. 7.2% cash advances. And I had all this like compiled and the light bulb just went off and I ended up just like financing the whole thing on credit wow. cards, jumped into the mix and uh, really just dove headfirst in into the cannabis world of, of growing indoor and big learning curve. Uh, we had this like super top notch room at the time. Uh, there was no Gavitas back then. There's no LEDs. Right. Where were you guys growing? Romulan? Like, wasn't that a big strain uh, around that time in Oakland? Grew, uh, maybe even that was grew, past Romulan. <laughs> Remember Mr. Nice Guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were growing Mr. Nice Guy. That was a haze, yeah. right? Kind of a real classic yeah. haze. Yeah, Yeah. super, like, leggy. Cerebral. Um, Cere really cerebral. I think it was, uh, is it Jack by Hash Plant? I, think, I know Hash Plant's in there, but. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do remember fun. that. Yeah. But the first round we tried growing, um, because it was the hot seller at the time for like 3,200 a unit, uh, to 3,500 a unit was sour diesel. Mm -hmm. Everyone is sour diesel, but sour diesel is a pretty tricky one to grow. Right. If you're kind of sativa like, right? Kind of, yeah, I'm, exactly. I haven't grown a lot of it, but, um, a little, it's a little more, uh, a little more sativa leaning than traditional OG, right? exactly yeah <laughs> and it will it'll stretch for miles just keep mm -hmm. growing i mean yeah. 10 12 weeks and um so uh, our buddy built us the grow room and then he took off he was just building grow rooms at that time and then he like went up to humboldt to you know build out a property and basically left us with this like we called it the space shuttle we're like dude thanks for building us the space shuttle and you didn't leave us a like owner's manual so we're like figuring out how to you know, grow 16 lights of sour diesel. And I mean, all the, all the horror stories, like let's go get coffee and fill the 250 gallon reservoir because there's a super awesome float valve on there and that will just turn off. And we came back and there's like water pouring out of the, oh, the roll up door. I mean, every nightmare possible. Oh, uh, no. We went to the big bounce festival back in the day that was in like Quincy mm -hmm. this is another horror story and uh we had 16 lights on the ground floor and then on top of that room we built a nine light room which we called the princess pad and it was on a um kill uh, is a kill switch or a flip switch so it was like 16 on and then nine off and then nine on 16 off and it was flipping and we were actually like jet pumping water up like 15 feet into the nine light room. And we're like, we're going to the festival. Like we're all, this is, this is all automated. This is like before all this like radical automation technology. And we went, this was Mr. Nice Guy round and it was like bang and it was doing so well. And we went to the bounce festival for like five, six days, probably, you know, three days longer than we were supposed to be out there. And we came back and all the lights were on. It didn't, it never flipped. Oh, so everything in hermaphrodited, uh, big learning curves back then. But we got it going, we got it cruising along and, you know, made it a well-oiled machine after like a year and a half. Uh, and actually turned a little bit of revenue on it things just got a little bit like gnarly over there and in, in oakland there was like shootings and people were breaking in that it was like one of those locations that was too good to be true it got discovered pretty quickly and uh when one of our workers locked up for the night um and went out to his car in the back parking lot uh there's two cars uh, in a high-speed chase, one was a, a a van chasing a car, and they pulled down the back alley, 
thinking they were going to get away and it was a dead end and they hit a fence and poor Joey's out there like trying to get to his car and then the van opens up and there was like full on gunfire uh, shootout. And he's like ducking behind the car. That's when we were like, nah, it's time to get rid of this thing. So moved back up to Tahoe and uh, that was like 2012 and took some time actually in the house that I'm in right now. I found this house nine years ago and I was drinking and using a lot of drugs at that point. A lot, a lot of us were, we were just rage face kids and partying and didn't really take the, like, the cannabis thing too seriously. It was more to supplement, you know, the going up to the festival for a week and leaving the <laughs> grow room behind right. unoccupied. And, uh, that's when, you know, I started to kind of, there's this like, I don't know, the universe speaking to me or something or this voice in my head, like, dude, you gotta get your shit together. You need like, you're going to die. Like you're, you're, you're drinking every day. You're using hard drugs every day. Um, and I was just completely unhappy, suicidal, um, very just down and out. Right. And it took probably another nine months uh, for me to really rein it in. And it was like, you know, this one more time, I'm just going to go out just this one more time, that, that whole thing. And I found myself just deep down in despair after like a three day bender. And, um, I walked next door to my neighbors right here and, uh, knocked on his door. I remembered, he told me that, uh, he, he didn't drink when he introduced himself. He was like, yeah, come on in, let's have a beer, you know, middle of the day on like a Tuesday. And no, I, I, I don't drink. My wife doesn't either. And, um, that kind of like landed with me and it stuck with me for you know six months. And it was just this thing. Like there's actually people that don't drink and opened up that possibility. Yeah. Use drugs. Like it was yeah. like a whole other world. I didn't even think that world existed. That's how like fried I was. And, um, yeah, I walked next door and he's like, come on in, you've come to the right place. I just basically just like surrendered and was like, I need help. And, uh, that sent me off, you know, they, they're in, they're in the 12 step program and, uh, they invited me to go to a meeting with them and, uh, coming up on nine years later in September, uh, gave all that world up and, um, had money that I was going to invest in to a restaurant. I was going to open a bar forfeited that, you know, I had a liquor license, put, put all that back in the, into the lottery and, uh, took, just started to take, you know, sobriety seriously and pulled away from a lot of friends. I wasn't growing at the time. It, it was almost like a perfect time. Like when you hit a bottom and there's like nothing for you, like barely any friends, the girlfriend laughed. It was like a tragic country song. Um, but I just stuck with it. And, you know, that was my entry point into sobriety and, and learning a, a more spiritual way of living. And, um, yeah, I did 90 meetings in 90 days. And then I was like, were you, you know, smoking like, weed at that time? Were you stoned? No, so that's, like that's the thing. Like I never, I was never much of a weed smoker. Um, I mean, I, here and there, but I was never like, I, I never had that like stoner phase in high school that a lot of kids do that are just like taking bong hits every day and before school and after school, I was more of a drinker and like loved, loved uppers, ecstasy, ketamine, <laughs> coke, mm -hmm. <laughs> put it, put it in front of me. I'd do it. Um, sure. and, uh, but yeah, that, so th this is actually a good topic to explore because the AA program and the 12 steps, I'm really vocal about it. I'm very that's, vocal. That's kind of what I wanted to hear from you it, it, because I think a lot of people that might listen, you know, I'm interested in talk in your perspective on sobriety while using plant-based medicine. I think yeah. that's a really good topic. It is. And, um, you know, there's, 
there's all these labels. Everything has to have a label these days. And there's this big label, Cali Sober, going mm-hmm. around. Right, Cali Sober is like a little bit of uh, Steve D'Angelo just wrote a, a great article on it, and mm. like uh, you know, you can microdose, you know, uh, psilocybin and, and smokes, you know, some cannabis. And to me, like ayahuasca I ceremony would probably correct. be Cali, Cali Sober. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mega Canyon. Let's just go down there and yeah. be Cali Sober. But you know, these these labels, I, I don't really you know do too well with them even though it's like someone could say well you're labeling yourself sober so when i was in aa in those early days like i had to be completely abstinent AA is like abstinent um you have this addiction and this disease um and this like problem with thinking and this is this is the way now and the 12 step program like casted its net to me when I was drowning in the tidal wave and they pulled me in to the boat. Right. And I'm on that boat and the boat took me across the shore into some, you know, calmer waters, but it's like, you don't really get off the boat. (laughs) It's like, well, I want to get off the boat now and I want to go do other things. I want to explore, uh, some plant-based medicines, right? I want to uh, learn about like, why the hell was I a reckless drug addict and had this chaotic relationship with drugs and alcohol since I was 14 years old, 18 years. Mm-hmm. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't get off the, you don't quite get off the boat, Brian, because it's a scary world out there and your disease is going to overcome you and uh, don't turn your back on the program that that saved you. And it's almost this like David and Goliath thing, like Goliath being your um, addiction and you're just still David and you have to succumb to your addiction all the time. And that's kind of what AA and the 12 step recovery, the the powerless, the powerlessness, right. Mm -hmm. And the disease uh, theory and me being this like, nonconformist, you know, I'm not into authorities. And uh, I, I started to question all of that, like, and the big question came when, you know, I'm in Tahoe. So people are always injuring themselves from skiing, biking, hang gliding, whatever they're doing, you know, to the extreme. And I'm in there in these rooms. And it's like, okay, like, you know, anonymous, like Johnny over here is like, on Oxycontin and Percocet because he blew his knee out and he's got 10 years of recovery. And next thing you know, that 10 years of recovery is out the window because Johnny's now drinking vodka with mm-hmm. his Oxycontin because that, that goes really well together as a format. Right. Um, or Susie's like, can't quite get over the hump of her anxiety and depression and she's on Xanax and Prozac and Lexapro and all the SSRIs and benzos and then you know painkillers and I'm like this isn't right mm-hmm. like this is not right and I was still and I was growing at the time and so I started to kind of like question all that mind you like I didn't know what direction I was going my brain was like completely um I had to rewire my whole brain and system and so that, that was another seed and you hear in there like, oh, cannabis is a drug. It's, it's, it's bad. Well, cannabis is a drug because of the war on drugs and mm-hmm. you know, president Nixon in 1972 declaring a public enemy number one. So if you trace that back, there's a lot of propaganda and false information about this plant. Right. So that's really when, I started to think of like, okay, that's where Medicine Box was born from, really like my journey through recovery and questioning how we look at recovery and treating humans holistically and being able to be sovereign in your own health and happiness and make your own choice for whatever it might be. If you want to, um, you know, microdose some psilocybin 
three days a week because it helps with prolonged well-being, great. If you want to microdose some cannabis formulations to help you sleep at night, to relax your nervous system, amazing, right? And I think it's also poignant to talk about that in 1937, Bill W., um, the founder of AA, he took uh, LSD mm. uh, to have a spiritual experience with Aldous Huxley. Mm. And I know that. yeah, Bill W. had his spiritual awakening when he was in the hospital and the window was open and a, a, uh, some, a breeze of air came through and it fluttered the cur- the white curtains. And it, he's like, that's, that's God. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's the divine. That's someone speak something bigger than me, a, a higher power speaking to me. And he was so um, involved in people's recovery that he really just wanted everyone to have that spiritual awakening that he does, he did. And that is really the big underlying um, that's the Goliath that you need to overcome is like having a spiritual way of life. And he thought LSD was the way to kill the ego, dissolve the ego and get people to have that spiritual awakening that he did that came easy for him. And that's not really talked about that much. That was, that was buried just like a lot of these new plant-based medicines and the psychedelic Renaissance that is now rising to the top. It's not black and white. And, and you're right. The war on drugs has, um, you know, kind of created this model of only pharmaceutical drugs, you know, are acceptable. Yeah. Everything else is illicit and, and, you know, you're a criminal or a bad person and, and, it, and people that are just trying to get well. And then yeah. I also think about, you know, maybe the recovered addict who is triggered by someone saying, well, I, I use, I microdose psilocybin. I can certainly understand someone maybe who was you know a hardcore drug addict having issues with that but i think the 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 propaganda from our own government has kind of created this like that david and goliath syndrome you're talking about and and it sounds to me like your journey was trying to find you know medicine to heal yourself yeah that that didn't take you back to the old brian you know you you were creating a new version but with the aid of um of plants i mean i think of cannabis you probably do too is not as medicine but as food mm-hmm. and you can eat too much you know food too and i think you can probably use too much cannabis but we need to eat and and we have an endocannabinoid system for a reason and, and it's a supplement you know it mm-hmm. you know it's, it's exactly it's, how i see it is it it's a I, i've been you know shifting my own perspective on on that plant as it's a, a supplement or a nutraceutical or a daily mm-hmm. life and being able to uh, mindfully consume it, I think is really uh, another topic to explore versus like, you know, oh, cannabis isn't addictive per se. It's right. not uh, physically addictive, but there is the uh, ability for it to uh, be a form of escapism. Sure. And there's a fine line there. And uh, so in my, my journey in that recovery, I started to uh, supplement um, what, you know, shifting my perspective. It was like, I'm not waking up and taking like four bong hits and jumping onto the Xbox for mm-hmm. $5, right? It's like, I'm going to sleep at night. And it's like, what is my intention of taking this medicine. I mean, it started to, you know, the the 12-step program kind of like frightened me a little bit where I was like, oh, am I a bad person now for taking five milligrams of a formulation that has all these like well-balanced synergistic herbs in there and a terpene profile and a cannabinoid profile that is like specifically blended and formulated to target my nervous system. And I just would tell myself that you know, this is to actually help you, right? To, to get to the, a better place. But I also had other tools that I was using, meditation, Qigong, uh, a mindfulness practice that I've developed over the years that is like daily medicine to me. 
music, you, you mentioned food, like shifting my diet around, like uh, high fat and uh, no, cutting out sugar, uh, high fat protein, cutting out sugar, grains, uh, as well as, you know, community collaboration. And then, you know, being in nature has always been something that's, um, you know, near and dear to my heart since I was a little kid. And all of that really became all the tools in my medicine box. And that's what that's where medicine box came from, where at one point, the 12 step program was the only tool I had, it, it was like the whole toolbox that so now it's like, I have this like 12 step recovery thing that is like filling up the larger toolbox with all those other action items that I mentioned. And, you know, always as a student and exploring and, you know, with, I sat with peyote and, uh, you know, in the Lakota tradition, Wachuma and San Pedro cactus, I microdose psilocybin. Um, and, you know, I've microdosed LSD once in a while. And it's all, it's all for um, having, you know, what I call improving my conscious contact with the universe, right? And, uh, you know, go into last Sunday, I did a, a deep um, psychedelic cannabis, conscious cannabis circle with one of the practitioners from medicinal mindfulness. They're out of Boulder. And uh, their founder, Daniel McQueen, wrote a book called Breaking the Gate. And he uses cannabis as his medium, like as his psychedelic and theogen of choice, because it's a lot more accessible than DMT and combo and <laughs> Aya and all the other, you know, bigger name plant medicines that I think a lot of folks, when they hear the word plant medicine, they may automatically go to like ayahuasca and all that. It's like, no, plant medicine can be staring at the aspen tree out my window or go yeah. hugging a tree or your chamomile tea at night. And sure. The smells, self. yeah, the, the yeah. sounds. Um. That's how I, I see it. And, um, you know, but again, like I'm not a doctor, you know, disclaimer, this is my own experience and it's worked out, you know, pretty well so far and it's afforded and, me to be able to build a business around this i do and, feel like i mean this is something i think about a lot and you know i'm not sober but i, I know people that are and I, and i think um i remember talking to a homeless guy in big sur about the difference between alcohol and cannabis and I remember, I remember asking him, he, he, was, he was a super cool guy. I mean, some of the coolest people on the planet are alcoholics, you know, yeah. and they have, and they have these moments of clarity that are just unbelievable. And I caught this guy, homeless guy with this moment of clarity, I was talking to him and, and, and I asked him, I said, Hey, do you, cause I was struggling with it too. Cause I was drinking a lot. I was bartending, you know, just that culture I was growing. I was, I was drinking a lot and smoking a lot. And, and I was kind of struggling with like, God, am I, am I just, you know, Am I getting a little too fucked up every day? Am I, am I using this as an escape? And so I asked him, I said, Hey, do you see a difference between alcohol and cannabis? And he said, Oh, absolutely. He said, told me alcohol cuts off your connection to higher power. Mm -hmm. Cannabis actually opens it up. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people use alcohol with the same mindset or medicinal intention. You could, I suppose, and, you know, but it's pretty rare. I think the mindset usually is almost 100% celebration, which is great, you know, or escapism. Cannabis can be those things too, but I think it has a much deeper and profound medicinal, spiritual and healing quality to it. And I could never prescribe mm -hmm. something for another person, but I know for my own life, the use of cannabis, you know, if my mind and my intention is strong and in harmony with the plant, it usually does provide a lot of healing. You know, it can really open up channels. It can really, um, sometimes it can scare me. I mean, you know, Take yeah. a strong edible and it takes you down a rabbit hole but usually yeah. i end up kind of working stuff out when that happens you know do you experience that like do you are yeah. you, you know is is your journey with this with the sacred plants you know with the sacred medicine the unprocessed medicine the natural stuff you know it's a personal journey it's a journey of healing and recovery um, but it's kind of like the new recovery model. Like maybe the old recovery model isn't updated enough. It's too rigid. You know, that's what it seems like to me. Well, too rigid 
and it hasn't kept up with neuroscience. Right. There's a lot more that we know about the brain and, and the mind being the byproduct of the brain and mindfulness techniques and a lot of like ancient wisdom and, and Eastern healing modalities making their way into uh, the West. And I think that's a, a also um, very, uh, to be open-minded about the rigidity. And it's like, I, I'm not like disowning the 12 step program. I'm not saying, Oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. Or, it worked. It's, it's, it pulled me in when I needed it the most. And I think you, you have to, if you want to continuously spiritually evolve and use other uh, mediums to reveal more about yourself, you have to start kind of looking outside of that box that you're in. And I like what you said about the homeless man in Big Sur. And uh, I always say like addicts and, and alcoholics are some of the most amazing people I've ever met because uh, <laughs> we have big hearts. We just don't always know how to direct them. Right. But really a lot of what our, you know, trauma, uh, problems are stem from trauma and it's our, our thinking is just a little bit off and <laughs> there's our thinking mind not the brain the byproduct of the of the brain is what gets us kind of caught up on those in the in the loops and uh yeah he couldn't have said it any better it's like alcohol is very spiritually uh, restrictive and, and cannabis and and you know meditation and other you know plant-based medicines is spiritually expansive and it's mm -hmm. kind of like what container do you want to play in do you want to be spiritually expansive or do you want to be spiritually restrictive and if you want to be restrictive that doesn't mean that you're a bad person it might be just like this is the way i'm dealing with my trauma right now and you know a leader of of jack daniels is my medicine like you can all, almost switch that i'm not condoning that but um and and we addicts and alcoholics and and you know the homeless and, and mentally ill and uh mental health it's like our society again has there's so much propaganda around it that you're you're a criminal criminal you're a bad person uh you can't get your shit together um you're you're a bum right all these like negative like connotations that go with that it's like well let's look at the the wider like open it up to the wider perspective that um our society really isn't built if to to for humanity it's it's like keeping up with the joneses instant gratification uh economic disparity marginalized communities you know intergenerational trauma and we don't really have those tools growing up or, or going through school at least you know maybe our generation Levi you're 40 I'm 41 we're like cusp millennials you know then 10 the the mm -hmm. millennials that the elder the elder millennials yeah we, we remember like, life without phones and internet yep. it's like it's like there's a lot of like change happening and you know I was talking to a uh uh someone that um a mentor yesterday um and we were talking about like that movie Seaspiracy and, and just, just the state of the world. And yeah. he's just like, he's like, you know, it's just, and this guy's like super woke and really spiritually, you know, expansive. And he's like, you know, Brian, it's just, it's a really tough time to be a human in this world right now. And I always remind myself that like gratitude is so huge. It's, it's the only shortcut. And, and, and like every day I'm grateful that I get to look out at the lake and go walk in nature. And especially in 2020 uh, with, with COVID, you know, I wasn't living in a city and an apartment building in New York and couldn't do anything. And it's like that amount of isolation, humans aren't meant to stay inside. They need right. vitamin D. We're mm -hmm. meant to play in the dirt and, and the trees and be around people so it's like the real pandemic wasn't COVID. It was like this isolation and like pulling us away 
from community and self and yeah. over 8,000 people last year died of drug overdoses, the most yeah. in history. And I think about that a lot, the unintended consequences of these lockdowns, you know, and I, you know, I try to stay out of the politics of it all. You know, I understand people's concerns and I share them, but you know, we have to look at the whole picture, right? It, right. We get so divided as a country over this stuff. Um, you know, but you, you have to look at the, I think about that all the time. I think about the addicts during this pandemic huh. who probably can't go to 12 steps. You know, the 12 steps have, no. are shut down, right? I mean, they're probably Zoom no, I would say my uh, 11 step, which is a meditation meeting all through 2020, actually up until January, um, the day after the, the rate, the uh, Capitol building. Right. Uh, rage yeah. form. Uh, but yeah, we had Zooming. It's just not the same. Mm -hmm. And like, the amount of folks that were relapsing and struggling. It's like isolation is the act the worst thing for an alcoholic. Yeah. In a, like, because you're with yourself. And again, yeah. extremely grateful that I had developed a meditation practice and developed uh, a routine and ritual that allowed me the space to be comfortable alone and in my own skin and have my connection with the higher power. And many people don't have that or haven't found that or are still trying to find that. And in the 12 step program, yes, the 11th step is sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. Uh, I change it to universe. Uh, but there's not much literature and there's not many teachings that actually are like, well, let's meditate, right? Like I tried to propose that like every meeting, my local meeting was like, we'd open up with a 10 minute meditation. And it's like once a week was a meditation meeting for eight minutes. And I ran that meeting, but I'd always set the timer for 10 and be like, Hey, every, <laughs> Every week, an extra two minutes, you get, you know, you get that extra 10 minutes, you know, so it's almost like an extra day and people in there would be like, this is my only time that I meditate for the week. And I saw myself get, getting attached to other people's well-being, kind of like Bill W was doing. And I checked in with myself and it, that's not a good place to be because it's autonomous and the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking and using. And I was like, you need to, Sally, you, you should meditate more. Like, and I started kind of like taking inventory of other people. And it's like, you can meditate outside of this meeting. You don't have to wait for me to guide you doing it. And I had to back off of that and, and call one of my, my elders, um, this woman, I call it, uh, she's, a great friend and she's been in the program for like 40 years and talked it through with her and she's like you're getting attached to other people's well-being right now brian and that's beautiful but you have to remember that it's 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 everyone's on their own journey and maybe you shouldn't um maybe you shouldn't share this meeting anymore you've held on to it for three years everyone wanted me to just stay and i had to give it up and i gave that up and uh kind of like to explore other type of work, you know, trauma, you know, healing and, and really just, uh, you know, it stepped I, away I, from 12 step. I don't want to say quit. It's just, I just took some time away to kind of shift my perspective and, uh, get away from that rigidity, as you say. Sure. So I think there's, I think there's a lot of awareness and healing, um, happening right now. And, and you mentioned harmony with, with the earth. Mm -hmm. And I kind of want to circle back to that because I, yeah. I think, I think that that's really kind of what's going on, you know, like, you know, we we're talking about cannabis and alcohol and, you know, in the West is such an alcohol industrialized capitalism, you know, like cannabis doesn't fit in with industrialized capitalism really well. No, you know, capitalism <laughs> is go, 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 you know, like and, and cannabis is like, well, I don't know, let's just chill out, you know, and, but the East is a hashish culture and, and the East mm -hmm. is far more spiritual really than, than the West and um, the, the mindset, you know, and the dedication to, um, to the spiritual practice. Yeah. And I think, I think 
there's a real disconnect, unfortunately, right now in the West, but I think we're all actively trying to heal it. And I think harmony with earth for me, at least is at the center of that. And, you know, and you're in Tahoe and one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I think that that lake is magical. Um, like give me some hope that yeah. what's going on right now with, yeah. with, with the movements that you're seeing, cause you're more plugged in than just about anybody I know, I think with kind of, and I don't want to call it new age, but at least I think just real progressive, um, I'm yeah. thinking on these issues, like you almost speak a different language sometimes, Brian, like I get your emails and you're on this vibration, this frequency. And I just want people to, to hear from you about yeah. this concept of harmony with mother earth, because I think it gets lost. And I think it, it, it sounds cheesy to some people. And I, I want to yeah. dispel yeah. all of that stigma around this concept. So just, yeah, I'll demystify go. that. <laughs> um, like you said, you know, the, capitalization and, and and corporatization of of the west and manifest destiny and and when uh america was discovered you know 400 plus years ago uh there's native people on this land navajo and sioux and, and lakota and uh they were not in harmony with mother nature they were mother nature right this earth the disconnect was, what the fall hadn't happened you know fall hadn't happened. The, the, like was there wasn't even a word for nature right in a lot of those languages like they just yeah, yeah exactly they just were you know they just were they just are and you know uh the discovery of this country right was the birth of colonialism mm -hmm. colonialism came in and pulled us humans away from nature okay then it pulled us away from each other and then it pulled us away from ourselves that was like yeah that's the, that's the progression that's the progression that linear progression but it's really been caught up in this negative feedback loop. right and it's like okay here's this untapped massive resource of beautiful sacred land and let's extract as much as possible out of it to build for the superior race, right? Mm -hmm. This is what we call the patriarchal system, right? This just math, this white race that we're a part of. You and I, we're white men. We're probably privileged white men in a lot of people's eyes. But we're, again, just like the mind is a byproduct of the brain, we're a byproduct of this this system. I don't, we didn't create it, and I think we're trying to do a lot of work to um to dissolve it mm -hmm. in um in very like a sustainable conscious fashion so uh enter the age of industrialization uh carnegie and, and steel and and now we're building cities and we're just you know taking over <clears throat> the country and then through the age of industrialization uh you got world war one world war two uh, baby boomer generation it's like the baby boomers they get a, the boomers get a lot of like you know people make fun of them it's like my parents your parents they're boomers but like their parents our grandparents they just wanted to have families they wanted to live like a nice life <laughs> like it's like yeah. they just went through wars and famine and the depression much different era and that's important to pay attention to there wasn't right. really the consciousness that is happening now then and I think that, that needs to be paid attention to. And instead of like bashing them, it's like, let's have some compassion for them. Like right. let's screw them in. Like, and you, you have to get to a point where you have some free time to explore spirituality. If you're just trying to feed yourself, yeah. there's not a lot of time left in the day to explore these things. So exactly. it's kind of like the blessing and the curse of it. I mean, we have more leisure time available to us because of, you know, this that, system. That, that could be a whole other topic to explore, like the, the free time and self-empowerment and the, the coaching and personal development movement. Mm -hmm. Oh, me, 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 me. It's all about me. And I'm just uh, watch my self-care routine and all this. Like, right. Right. Just leave your time. The, well, what, the wellness what you, movement. Yeah. What are you doing with that? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> are you taking what you've learned to like, you know, be of service to others or, uh, and just do it without expectation of like a monetary 
exchange. Right. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's a side note. But here, age of industrialization, right? We built up capitalism. Okay, life's good, money everywhere, uh, and then uh, that created a lot of like economic uh, disparity and this class, you know, class system really that's like uh, folded into capitalism that we don't really see. And then the age of, um, you know, technology or inf age of information kind of where we're at now. And then 10 years ago, right? Like the millennial generation, smartphones, <clears throat> okay? Smartphones came out, app culture. That was like right when I left San Francisco, I started to see it get really gentrified in like 2012. And it was a rise of app culture. And now there's so much information coming at us at all times, which again is feeding into the colonialistic linear model of remove us from nature, remove us from selves, from each other, remove us from self. And as you've seen in the last probably a couple of years, definitely through 2020, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, uh, COVID, conspiracy theories, QAnon, all this like new age stuff, 5D, I'm ascending and all mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. Polarity, yeah. divisive, divisiveness. And it's like cancel culture. That's a whole other one that I'm just like, you, this is insane. Like, mm -hmm. um, because there's pe evil people. Jordan Peterson says there's e like cancel culture. There's evil people lurking in the shadows that you don't even know about that are just waiting and waiting for our, for everyone to get so weak that they're just going to come and, and take us over. And it's like capitalism. They're like, great. We're at the top of the class and all you peasants down here, just keep fighting each other because uh, Levi, you know what? You said something about um, cannabis that I just don't agree with. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't talk that out with you. I don't want to see your perspective because mine, mine's better. So I'm going to cancel you. And it's this triangle. It's this victim, savior, hero, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're the, uh, sorry, villain, mm -hmm. villain, victim. Mm -hmm. you're the villain. Okay. I'm going to cancel you because I'm going to be the hero. Mm -hmm. Now I'm telling myself that I'm the hero by canceling you. But in reality, I'm just becoming the victim of my own, like, uh, unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. So, that's that's all happening right now and I, I i pay attention to it maybe like too much um and i definitely can get sucked into social media and um you know the different um <clears throat> what am i trying to say the different uh viewpoints and like uh, back to the labels cancel culture virtue signaling mm -hmm. uh, Cali sober, uh, I'm, I'm social justice warrior, anti-social justice warrior. It's like, yo, let's get back to being in harmony with nature before all this bullshit happened with colonialism. None of that mattered because we we're all just living in harmony with each other, with ourselves and with nature as earth citizens of this world in this earth and like we're just going in fucking circles we're in this like we're, we're we're like a pair of like sneakers in a dryer going da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. and it's like turn the dryer off take their sneakers out and put them on and just take a walk or like, put them out in the sun you know but... put them out in the sun and there you go <laughs> like don't use electricity or like you know throw microplastics up in, into the sky but that's that's my kind of take on it and i think um covid is the under so many people were focusing on the numbers and cdc and i'm a vaxxer and you're an anti-vaxxer and okay you're you're a vaxxer so i'm canceling you it's like oh my gosh it's like be sovereign in your own choice take the vaccine do whatever you need to do sally just don't tell me what i need to do with my body that's it we can be friends okay uh, but that 
underlying message, I think the like the fundamental philosophical truth of what the message of COVID delivered a lot of us was this message of reprioritizing our personal selves and well-being in our professional lives and really looking at what matters in people in the cities. Again, this is what triggers me being up in Tahoe that I have to explore in my own self. Why am I getting triggered with the amount of techies here now? Like Silicon Valley has moved to Tahoe or they've moved to Texas or Florida, but the amount of homes like that were bought in the last year, 30 to 40% were from Facebook and Google. And Tahoe's being uh, overrun by what we call Zoom. It's been labeled as Zoom towns now, you know, mm -hmm. remote workers and mm -hmm. the economy and Facebook and Google employees taking 30 to 40% pay cuts to stay in their remote living uh, lifestyle now where before they're on the campuses in Silicon Valley and coming up for the weekends. So what my mission, harmonizing a relationship with Mother Earth that's triggering when I can't even go to my local like tiny post office with one postal worker that I know by name that gives my dog treats every time we go in there because there's a line out the door and there's five Teslas in the parking lot, mm -hmm. right? And there are people honking horns now. <laughs> when did you, when did, I've never heard someone honk a horn in Tahoe. Like, it's, ah, just get out of the way. It's like, yo, you, you're driving like you're- You're being very on Tahoe. Yeah. So, right now right you're like coming down fell street going like 60 trying to like race all the lights um but that's triggering to me but then i have to realize like okay well everyone deserves to be happy and everyone deserves to have some like uh connection to nature even though they don't a lot don't know how to what i say do kimberly dillon you know kimberly dillon no former cmo of a pup and Barkley and oh yeah, a little plug here. So her her brand now is uh, Get Frig, but mm -hmm. uh, she's been trying to come up to Tahoe in the last couple of years to to be in the snow because, as she says, she doesn't know how to do nature. She wants to learn how to do nature, and I mm -hmm. love that because she actually mm -hmm. wants to learn how to do it. There's people that come up here that it's like nature's my trash can, and the we're just gonna leave like diapers on the beach and. Mm -hmm plastic everywhere and broken sleds and uh, the dumpster's full. So we'll just pile our trash next to the dumpster instead of like, because out of sight, out of mind, it's someone else's problem now. Uh, that's really frustrating and it's frustrating a lot of locals, but Brian is like, how can we educate these folks? How can we bring awareness? Because right. I think it's a beautiful thing that like, uh, I see a lot of minorities up here now and it's amazing. It's like, y'all need connection to nature, but we need to learn how to do it together. And that is a byproduct back to that colonialistic uh, equation. Like you've, you've been so removed from nature and, and what it means um, to, to be in touch with it, that it, it's not even a thought that like, oh, I'm, um, you know, undoing like a piece of plastic like this, and I'm just gonna throw it down on the ground or a bottle cap or, I mean, I'm always taking walks in the forest and filling my pockets up with little bits of plastic trash. And, um, but that that's, there's this big influx coming out of the cities into a yeah, lot of the rural yeah. areas. Not just yeah. Tahoe. For sure. Yeah, you're hitting a pain point. And I think a lot of people feel that people that are in rural communities, you know, and, and gentrification, you know, obviously, you know, people are getting priced out and, and there's a culture. You know, I always think of like Hawaii, you know, and the yeah. Hawaiians, you know, there's a real culture and and people come over um, and maybe don't respect that culture. It's like leave trash on the beach or, you know, uh, touch the turtles in the water, like, you know, like just do things. It's like, no, these turtles, just leave them alone. Like, They've been here for millions of years, just like, yeah. you know, appreciate them, but don't go and mess with them. It's not an amusement park. 
you know right. this yeah, is these are real time. living beings you know that that have heartbeats and thoughts and, and fears yeah. and, and i think a lot of people we have become so disconnected that we kind of forget that and you know i, I mean i i'm looking for optimism and everything these days because I, I think that's the only choice we really have and i'm seeing some optimism with um you know using that you know you're talking about the tech guys but we can use this technology we're using it right now i think to share a good message and a lot of people have gotten into home gardening because of you know youtube and people sharing you know here's how to start a tomato garden and people grab that and they go out and they start a tomato garden like we need everybody to be starting gardens right now like yeah. i think if you have space to grow some food do it like there's probably nothing better you could do for yourself to heal your connection to absorb good nutrients out of the soil to carbon sink you know with that soil to, to create literal carbon sinks you know everywhere we need to like just garden every flat surface you know in the world and be growing food and get with, get away from industrialized agriculture and, and that that's the big one for me it's mm -hmm. like yeah who knows who started the fire you know somewhere this fire started but i think that capitalist mindset of always scaling up right go big or go home. It's always got to be bigger. It's always got to be more efficient. I think that's what we're starting to question. At least, yeah. you know, I am. And I, and I feel like we want to go back to a model that is more localized. And I think COVID has taught us, if, if COVID hasn't taught us anything else, it's that our supply chain needs to be reconsidered. Yeah, right. Absolutely. And I think there's a lot of good that can come out of that. And if we take that momentum and say, look, we need to make sure that we have food and medicine and the, you know, we are able to be a self-sufficient closed loop system if we need to, because this global economy sounded great in, you know, the nineties, you know, to a lot of people, you know, it just seemed like, yeah, it's just, you know, ship mangoes all like nothing's ever out of season. You can have mangoes year round, tomatoes year round. Everything is available all the time. It doesn't necessarily need to be that way. You know, I think, I think people could get into seasonal, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, it's, it's tomato season. Like we just don't have tomatoes, you know, like even Burgerville up in Oregon, I'm an Oregonian, like they don't put tomatoes on their hamburgers when tomatoes are out of season. Like that's cool. And that like makes a brand for them. Right. People are like that. Like I'm talking about it right now, you yeah, know, just like aware. Exactly. Exactly. It's the awareness component where, you know, we, we are the earth, right? Just like the Native American, like, we're not separate from it. What we do matters. And, and the earth is, the earth is, is this incredible spaceship floating around the cosmos. And it's this incredible system that has perfected uh, the creation of life so beautifully. And our monkey minds really get in the way and start cluttering that up. Mm -hmm. And I think, but I, I am hopeful that I see you know, people from our generation, the younger people, I see the, you know, the hippie movement from the sixties and, and the, I want to talk, can we talk about the human potential movement a little bit? Are you familiar with that movement? That'd be like the, the Esalen Institute and Big yeah. Sur. What the human potential movement kind of encompasses psychedelia and the use of psychedelic drugs. It encompasses the counterculture hippie movement, but what the central theme is that there's an untapped human potential in us. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from the earth. And it's like, we talked about the progression of we've, you know, separated ourselves from the earth and thus separated ourselves from each other and ultimately ourselves, you know, our true self or whatever you want to call it. And so to restore that connection, you know, do we need to heal ourselves first or is there a hack? And for me, my hack is it's easier to control my body than my mind. So like do the yoga do the meditation and just kind of let like your body shift your mind in a new direction rather than just being so in the mental sphere, you know, and that's just how I operate. I'm not diet. I'm not prescribing that for everybody, but I think another way, if you want instant healing in your life, go to, go to the earth, mm -hmm. like, like literally put your hands in the earth, you know, and absorb. I'm going to sound like a super hippie and I know I want to you, but maybe to some people listening, but there are microbes in the earth, you know, that are going to get into your fingernails. Like you literally go, a lot of people don't put their hands in the earth. Like if we can, I feel farming and agriculture, like the U S decided to be a hydrocarbon economy rather than a carbohydrate economy a long time ago, but we are a farming nation. You know, we have a ton of farmland. Look at California. It is a 
uh, it's it's a utopia, agriculturally speaking. You know, outside of like the Czech Republic, we have some of the most fertile land in the world right here in California. And it doesn't have to just be monocropped. We can, we can, we can go back to a diversification, regenerative farming. We can rebuild a different agricultural system that can feed everyone a higher nutrient quality product, a product that leaves the ground in better shape than when we started it. And I don't think it's that hard. I feel like there's, there's this defeatist mentality too out there right now where people are just like, oh, we can't, we can, we'll never get off fossil fuels. We'll never be able to change. And I, I think we can, it just takes the mindset to do it. And I think people will be happier, you know, like, like let's get government programs to subsidize farming. They do this in Oregon, the Oregon, uh, the state of Oregon gave grants to young people to go out and start farms, you know, organic certified small farms. We could have a national program to do that. You know, let's get people back into the earth. And I think we'll start to see the healing um, come out of that because that's what the earth is here to do. You know, it's here for us. It provides for us. It is our mother, literally, you know, nurturing us back to health. And if we're disconnected from it, and if all we're doing is searching for it through the digital channels and ignoring the organic channels, I, I think we're missing something. So I hope if anybody takes anything away, you know, from what I'm saying, I hope that they just go out and start a garden, you know, just plant some seeds. Like it, it will change your life, right? I mean, it's changed your life. It sounds like Brian, like you got into cannabis because of economic opportunity but i think that incentive and me too i started growing weed because of money i'm not gonna lie i needed money and it was like hey there's an opportunity here to make some money but that was like the gateway to me then i started growing all, all kinds of stuff it was the plant takes over you know yeah. doesn't matter if you're growing it in a warehouse in oakland weed. or out in the in the forest of big sur it's a magical plant i think it's an alien species and that's for another topic but i think it has a, a sentient conscious connection with us and when you grow that plant it's going to communicate with you and it's going to start healing you immediately you don't even have to smoke it yeah like just growing the cannabis plant on its own is an incredible healing and this is true for a tomato plant and other plants too but the cannabis plant just kind of has this at least for me a very special uh, psychic connection you know i really feel a communication happening um, the smells, you know, the, the, everyone loves cannabis in nature, the deer, the birds, the insects. It is, it is just like out there just being like this goddess, you know, it's, it, it is an absolute goddess plant just absorbing. Everyone loves it. Right. Like the natural cannabis plant growing wild out in nature is like, if you just walked into this forest, like it would just be glistening and shining and its perfume, you know, would, would take over the, the area. It's just an incredible plant that is so loved by nature that by growing it, you're tapping directly back into that ancient um, connection to nature. Even if you're growing it hydroponically in a basement in Oakland, like you're still tapping in, you know, and that, that gives me a lot of hope. I mean, we're growing a lot of cannabis right now. Yeah. you know, in the United States, like a lot of people are tapping into that root. Right. I love what you just said there. I mean, it's like production wise, it's like whatever minute that was timestamp that to where you just left off. There's a great <laughs> fizzle reel for you. Uh, very poetic. And uh, yeah, I got into cannabis too for economic uh, opportunity. And one thing I, what I didn't mention was, in uh, 2015, uh, ski accident, I was laid out mm. for like 30 days on, you know, laying down. And I came, this was like uh, right after like the, the biggest grow season I've ever had. Mm. I mean, I, I grew, me and my crew, we grew like 750 units. I mean, that that's like small potatoes. To mm -hmm. some, Indoor? But, Oh, we, oh we were, okay. yeah. I was gonna say, dang, in, indoor. That's a, that's yeah. serious outdoor. Like, yeah. That makes more sense. That, that was like outdoor. And, but there was this thing. It was like, cool. That was fun. What now? Like, like I say, like the extension of like my marketability at that time was like how many Turkey bags full of flour. Right. Right. <laughs> and add that up. And then it was like, yo bro, I, check out my 10 pound plane i grew a 12 pound gorilla glue i did this and i look at my new truck you know i put a new lift on it and it, all that grow bro stuff was going mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. like dude, i got a i had a tundra a land rover mm -hmm. a ranch vehicle the 
the Land Rover, you know, the, the kid like hit a deer and totaled it. And I was like, whatever. And I was like, is this, is this what I want to continuously pursue? And that's when I started learning about cannabinoid medicine and, and terpene profiles and making formulations with a mentor. And what you said there of like how the taproot of cannabis kind of just like gets in you, right? Mm-hmm. It was like in me, the spirit of cannabis that we've co-evolved with as mm-hmm. humans for thousands of years was in me somewhere. And, and that's when I was like, you know, I, I don't think I want, you know, my legacy, you know, people would consider me and you and I a legacy farmer, but it's like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not an OG. People are like, dude, you're an OG. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. Like, OGs were way right. before me, right. way. I, that, I don't even go near that. Like, yep. don't yeah, even, do, right? Yeah. It's like, so any OGs listening, thank you for paving the way. For sure. For and that's when I was like, I don't think I want to just grow for weight, like, and then have the, you know, turkey bags times 750 and be like, I, it, I didn't, it, I wasn't satiated. It was like that, like, almost that capitalistic. Right. Model. It's just become, it's just a commodity at this point. Scale, you know? scale let's just go mm-hmm. and let's grow more. And it's a we, like we used to have my, my collective at the time was called ABF flowering uh no abf collective and was abf always be flowering that was my motto mm-hmm. like, all year long just be mm-hmm. flowering mm-hmm. and um but yeah I, I i i pulled it back and was like i want to build a brand because this was 2016 ish and i knew 2018 was right down the pipe and we were going to get uh legal here in california and it was like do i want to cultivate, manufacture, distribute, own a dispensary, vertically integrated. That was the big business model at the time. And I was like, I want to be a brand. Like I want to build a brand. I don't know how the hell I'm going to do it. I've never done anything in the digital world. Uh, I've never done anything but like grow cannabis and sling drinks and Mm -hmm. sell blow pops when I was 13 and (laughs) break leaves and shovel driveways when I was a kid. And that was like the extent of my professional life. But what you said brought that up because there's so much intrinsic value and, and intrinsicness of this plant, the culture, the medicine of it, and really what it can do, uh, not only just for our endocannabinoid systems and contribute to a, a, a more holistic lifestyle, but what it can do on, on a larger scale of shifting mindsets that will help all of humanity. And mm-hmm. that's my optimism. I, I'm, you asked me to talk about optimism and I started talking about trash. Uh, <laughs> but like to tie that back in, I feel that it's the domino, right? That's going to really, you know, knock over. I agree. Uh, 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 the next the next domino and get into like agriculture like bed yep. and, and and the earth biome and yeah uh, i think hemp hemp you know the rastas say hemp will heal all the nations of the earth you know it's like i i believe that i i think i think there's a lot more to this plant than um than than we even give it credit for now oh. you know it's 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 reshaping um the landscape um, that we're going to yeah. be operating in in significant ways. I mean, not just, you know, economically, that's, you know, pretty obvious, you know, the spiritual work the plant does the mindset change that it's offered. I mean, I think any of anybody that's really gotten into weed has a story, right. You know, and, and it's usually a pretty powerful one. And the, and it's like all the coolest people, you know, and I love hanging, you know, I, I hang out with people that smoke, don't smoke, you know, my partner doesn't smoke and that's great. And like, people can do their own thing, but like, some of the best people I've met, you know, I've met through cannabis, you know, and right. sharing a joint and sharing that appreciation for the plant. And I really want people to try your products. Brian, Brian's brand medicine box is amazing. And um, I'll put the link up, you know, on the podcast so people can check out what you're doing. I know you're doing a lot of work with, with, um, you know, webinars and you, you just, you're really getting out there, man, and being a leader and a teacher and, um, and, you know, in, that, in Tahoe, you know, I haven't spent enough time there, but I know there's a, a you know i see tahoe as like one of those kind of vortex hubs you know there's like shasta tahoe big sur joshua tree 
you know, it's on the list of places you need to go if you need to tap in um, to something deep um, because of the nature there is just profound. There's just a heal, instant healing, I think, when you're just breathing that air. Um, Tahoe OG, just to talk about the genetics for a minute. I mean, it's like, go smoke some Tahoe OG and all, there's so many cool Tahoe crosses out there now, you know. Um, I've grown in uh, Nevada City a little bit with uh, Green Shock who I cultivate with um, up in that area and just some phenomenal flower. The outdoor flower from that area yeah. is uh, phenomenal. The yes. Exposure there in the terroir of, of Nevada County Grass Valley is like, you know, 1200 feet in elevation. And then you can go all the way up to like above 3000. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like Afku was yep. handed there in like 1972. Oh, invented there. Invented there. Wow. Like, I, I didn't know Afgu was that old. That's yeah, crazy. Uh, the original Afghani indica uh, seed was smuggled over uh, in, from um, OG mm. in, uh, from Humboldt. And then he uh, worked his seed all the way up British Columbia down to where you're at in San Diego. Mm. And, Afghu that Afghani landed on the ridge in like the seventies, and that's where Afghu uh, came from. And mm. uh, Afghani indica by Maui Hayes, I think. Mm. And mm-hmm. that was a that was a banger. That's like a fan yeah. favorite on there. Oh, for sure. I remember smoking Afghu specifically. I remember taking a bong rip of Afghu, you know, over a decade ago, and get in just um, it was like a different caliber of high, you know. <laughs> It was like, okay, this gorilla glue stuff, like what, you know, this is, this is, this, and it really is, they call it because it's so sticky. Like it is just such a sticky resinous plant. Um, yeah, the terroir in Tahoe. I'm, does, did Tahoe get regional designation by the state of California? I, I think it was left out, wasn't it? Yeah, it, I think so. That's a shame. That yeah. is a real shame. We're going to have to upgrade that. That's not okay yeah. because that area has a true terroir that no other place in California can mimic. Yeah. And well, Nevada County, I know, is working on uh, yeah. designations like Grass Valley. I mean, there's so many great nooks there, like mm-hmm. Grass Valley, Penn Valley. And, you know, hats off to all the homies in, in Grass Valley. Like, I've been, I've kind of stepped away from the whole cultivation, and, you know, scene down there, but there's some amazing cultivators. And like, right. Brian, you know, of, some, of, some real OGs coming out of that area. You know, and yeah, nutrient but, companies. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. John Blogman of Forever Flowering Greenhouse. Uh, right. Yep. Tech is there. Uh, like Yellow Dog Farms, my buddy John Foley, uh, Yuba River Organics, um, Green Hummingbird Farm. Uh, there's some There's some good, good people. Yeah, some there. real important contributions to the cannabis you know, space from, from that area. A lot of respect and... Um, I want people to come in and check it out. Just be considerate, you know, of the locals up there when you do and don't honk your horn. Um, but, yeah. but go check yeah. it out. Tahoe is, Tahoe is just, just an incredible yeah, that, spot. That vortex you mentioned of, of Tahoe, it's uh, it is, it's a pretty special, special vibe here. I mean, my, my parents met here in the late seventies in mm. 76 and then moved back to the East coast in 70, late 78. And I was born like, a little like 14 months later uh so i I grew up hearing tahoe and i call it my spawn of consciousness the more i Mm -hmm. like involved my consciousness i'm like well damn like time isn't linear right it's quantum and it's like i was pretty much like conceived in in tahoe with my parents like Mm -hmm. love for each other i mean they've been together for uh 42 years this coming august and you're going to see them next week, but uh, like, that's kind of like where, why I'm also very like uh, connected to this place. I grew up hearing of it and I was like, I'm, I knew I was moving there since I was a, a kid and I call it my base of inspiration. I use mm-hmm. this place as a, as a muse. And um, I know you mentioned some things about what, what I'm doing, but I wanted to let your, audience know that i'm offering i'm doing a giveaway right now on my instagram uh at 
underscore Brian Chaplin, uh, a trip for two uh, to Tahoe, uh, two nights at the, the Hyatt Regency on the East Shore, uh, dinner for two at like one of my favorite restaurants called Bite. It's um, American tapas and nice. great, great cocktail menu for anyone that likes to imbibe. Um, and a, a one hour Zoom consultation with uh, myself to, you know, just get them all, get the, the folks that win on the right path, so to speak, like off the beaten path. Like mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do is show people around up here and if you make it to Tahoe, look me up. 99% um, of the time I make time to go meet someone that took their time to say, hey, I'm in your area. Like I've gone skiing with people, met people for coffee. I've taken them swimming, paddle boarding. Uh, and it's just kind of a, a fun little thing that I like to do. And if all else fails, I'll be a tour guide. So nice. check it out on my Instagram. It's a giveaway and uh, there's some like, um, certain things to, to do to enter, like enter your email and you get points and, uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a fun little thing I'm doing. So I hope people will take advantage of that. Cause you know, you, it's like you have your products, but I really feel like medicine box really is in, in, you know, awaken too. It's kind of similar. It's like the products are a big part of it, of course, but it, it's really, we're trying to establish a community, you know, yeah. we're trying to just remind people how powerful we are together you know, yeah. and that we really can change things if we're together, you know? And, and so yeah. And that togetherness, you know, uh, you know, rising tides lift all boats and, you know, the, all those sayings of like to go fast, go alone, to go far, go together. But I, I think, you know, one of my qualms with prop 64 was like, kind of back to that capitalistic model was like it, it pulled a lot of us away from each other. And I sure. think so much confusion and no one knew what was going on. I don't think anyone knows what's happening still. <laughs> yes, uh, I agree. <laughs> right. And like, you know, bad contracts, bad partnerships. And I think people just trying to jockey for position and capture shelf space. And then you get the, like all the corporate money coming in and uh, I, I'm getting, I took a time away from, the prop 64 in 2020, but we're working on uh, getting our equanimity product back out into the marketplace and repackage, redesign, and uh, same, same great, you know, uh, award-winning Emerald cup award-winning formulation with the AFGU as the base nice. uh, of cannabis. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So we're getting that back out there. And then the, uh, medicineboxwellness.com is where you can you know, order products online and, and have the, C the CBD, the hemp. Yeah. The hemp so products, we, yeah. We have, yeah. Sleep product with CBD, CBN, and a variety of uh, beneficial herbs, uh, a gut health product. With right. CBD. Kind of before, before I let you go, because yeah. we didn't really get to talk too much about your products and you're such a talented formulator because you're going beyond, you know, I keep it really pretty simple, at least with my tinctures. Yeah. It's like base oil cannabis. And, yeah. and that's, that, that's just, I just kind of want to do that for the people who just want to rule everything else out, but maybe it's because I, I just don't feel confident enough to combine other herbs into an ingestible yeah. product, but you're really combining a lot. You're, you're using, you know, uh, mushrooms and complementary herbs. How did you come up with your formulas? What, how did you decide what plants to pick to, to work yeah. with cannabis? What kind of, well, like, help me understand uh, that because I'm fascinated yeah, by it. Yeah, me too. I'm fascinated by it too. And there's always more to learn. I, I learned a lot from my mentor, uh, Michael Hollister, 54 years mm -hmm. in cannabis. He was one of the OGs like up in Humboldt rolling around with like Lawrence Ringo and Martin Lee. And mm -hmm. Chris mm -hmm. Larson and Lawrence That's Ringo's Lee. gift. Is that that Lawrence Ringo or is that a yeah. different Ringo? Yeah. yeah. That, that Ringo, like mm -hmm. Tsunami Sue and Harley yep. Sue. Yep. When I met him, I mean, R.A.P. Michael, he's, he's left this dimension um three years ago this coming strawberry full moon but he showed me the importance of combining specific cannabinoid ratios with terpene profiles and mm -hmm. then using terp uh, terpene profiles from other botanical herbs and, and essential oil like you know lavender is the most basic you know uh, uh, one to explore is like 
lavender is really just linalool, the terpene, and it is very soothing. And that's why people feel relaxed around it. So you can start combining that with, say, myrcene, right? Like that is the dominant terpene in indica with the THC base of um, the afgu, you know, so to speak, and start playing around with all these these ratios. And really, it comes from like reverse engineering it. It's like, mm-hmm. what is the what's the the ailment that you want to uh, provide some relief? Sleep, gut health, energy focus, vitality, mood enhancement, or pain? Like those are kind of like the the big uh, top categories and just exploring you know what are the herbs that for for sleep most people everyone sleeps right (laughs) or everyone wants to sleep right hopefully Um, yeah (laughs) yeah so uh, like i would come up with kind of like a concept or a theme and then find people that are much more talented than i am in the science and realm of it and understand how to put that alchemy right together and for sleep it's like okay like look at sleepy time tea any sleepy time tea whether it's traditional medicinals or yogi brand it usually has chamomile skull cap licorice catnip some valerian mm-hmm. you know, some of the beneficial herbs that help soothe the nervous system now you're adding like terpene profile like linalool bisabolo uh myrcene and then some you know indica whole plant compounds but putting it together in a very strategic you know way with the ratios and then we did that with gut health uh, which we call happy belly and i started to research some of these minor cannabinoids like a year and a half ago and uh, cbg is uh grows in hemp predominantly at the early stages of the plant as well as cbc and the combination of both of those there's some studies already done on them uh, that show great promise in treating ibs which 40 million people in our country it's almost like 30 percent of our population have ibs kind of like a one-to-one ratio of cbg to cbc uh cbg is actually the dominant mm-hmm. uh, cannabinoid and there's just a little bit of CBC mm-hmm. and then looking at like, okay, what are some herbs that, you know, treat are good for soothing your digestive cinnamon, saffron, uh, grape seed, fennel, you know, and then kind of like, that's the concept, Mr. Scientist. Right. right? And then like uh, with the vital recovery, I wanted something that was like energizing immune boosting, focus flow, and, you know, a little bit like upbeat. And we use CBD, CBG, CBC, and CBN, like the CBN just to kind of like round off the, uh, the polysaccharides and the, the the medicinal mushrooms we use in there, which is mataki, shiitake, reishi, and chaga, and then turmeric uh, and ginger as the like nootropic herbal blend. And that is pretty energizing and and stimulating. One of my friends took it for the first time and she's like, holy shit, what is in this formulation? I just feel, feel like I microdosed MDMA. Right. And that's the power of plants. And when you put that in the correct ratios, you can really make some powerful medicine. And and that's, Uh, I always say form formula matters. You know, a lot of people shun natural products because they think they don't work and some of them don't because they're not formulated very well. Yeah. And a lot of traditional herbalists shy away from using cannabis for the same reason Western doctors do that, you know, they're afraid of the stigma. There's not yeah. a lot of studies or not enough good studies, you know, for them to point to. Yeah. So a lot of us that are, you know, at least speaking for myself, an amateur herbalist, you know, I'm not, I don't have a formal herbalism background, but I've been tinkering around enough and experimenting and selling products and collecting anecdotal data yeah. enough to kind of know, Oh yeah. You know, this cannabinoid and terpene ratio with chamomile and lavender does seem to really promote a calm, restful, relaxed state. And we have this kind of tribal knowledge and, and, and good 
herbalist history. I mean, the her- herbalists are some of my favorite people. Oh man. I mean, people that just dive that deep into plants, but I'm someone who believes that plant plant medicine can heal all disease. We just have to find the right formulas, you know? Um, yeah. And this is, this is really the frontier of uh, cannabinoids are the next big frontier and, and the pharmacopoeia, mm-hmm. you know, the pharmaceutical industry will go probably down the synthesized path. We'll, we'll keep the plant drive path alive people like us, but this is the future and combining cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, all these things with all these other powerful sacred plants. Mm -hmm. We're going to get better at extraction. We're going to start to learn more about combinations. Now the mushroom movement, you know, and beyond, beyond the psychedelics, you know, just, you know, it's, it's incredible. And, and I mean, just look at Chinese medicine, you know, open up, open up a book. There, there are so many herbs, uh, so many barks roots um, from all over the world. You know, they're the native Americans have some crazy, crazy shit. You yeah. know, they, they have, they know about, or they, they still guard some of these secrets, the tribes and the elders, you know, because they don't think that we're ready for it. You know, there, there's a deep, there's, there, there's people holding on to that knowledge of the plant medicine that colonialism tried to erase, right? Yeah. You know, that's the first thing you do. You got to sever the connection. And um, I think we're all trying to get back to it. But, uh, you know, Brian, I, I, I mean, I, I need to have you back on the show. Yeah, a lot of time. You just sparked <laughs> a couple more things. Like my mentor who made, who taught me about botanical medicine and formulations, he he learned from the Sioux and Navajo, actually. Mm-hmm. He, was a, he was a mediator for the Sacred Seed Project. Mm. Um, in, in dc where all the native tribes and first nations have mm. their sacred plants and that's still happening the sacred seed project yeah, and, he, yeah. and he was chosen to be uh the the mediator between the tribes um and and they moved i think they moved all the plants to like a, a big glass greenhouse but he had mm. some amazing stories of studying with like jamie sams um, mm-hmm. uh the el- an elder of the Sioux tribe and when I was like reading on Jamie Sams I'm like Michael you need to you need to check this article out and he's like oh oh, oh, brother Brian like I'm like what's so funny that he was like he was like my like uh Mr. Mr. Miyagi or like my Yoda right and he's like Mm -hmm. something you don't know I I studied with Jamie Sams's grandmother that's how I learned how to make these formulations right and he's like what you just said he's like but like us white people aren't ready for that yet there's a lot of knowledge still being obtained and, and I dam- damage can be done right you know i even think there's a lot of knowledge locked up into the hills in mendocino yes. and mendocino triangle 100 ogs and the, and the seeds people are yep. just like they're like what you guys just come eat each other up in prop 64 right. and then we'll be ready Right. right. I was like the, the more medicinal part of right. cannabis is, is moving along, but I know uh, we've been going for a little while and I thought that's all good, man. Off. Yeah. So much. Just... You sparked a lot of good, good stuff within me, man. It felt really, really good to talk with you about. Well, for sure. The fellow, for sure. With the fellow gunslinger. Yeah. So. Yep. No, we have really similar stories, you know, and, and, you know, you, it's cool, you know, the way, I think that we're trying to support each other, you know, and I just, I'm just rooting for all of us, you know, that, that are, yeah. that are trying to kind of hold space right now yeah. for the plant. That's how I feel, yeah. you know, and do well for ourselves too. And, and, and to grow and to thrive, but to really try to hold space and, and, and to recognize the OGs, you know, to not, you know, to not forget, to not forget about all the harm, to, to acknowledge our privilege, to, to do all that and to just talk about it and be in, but to not shy away from anything, you know? So I started this podcast. It's like, let we have, you know, let's use the first amendment. <laughs> let, let, let's talk about stuff. That's how the healing begins, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, we didn't even get into the war on drugs and marginalized communities and the amount of people that are in jail and you should get like Steve, Steve or uh, Andrew. Yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to. In a project. And yeah. Uh, another yeah, that- great guest would be like Siobhan uh darwish of uh grow sisters mm-hmm. yep yep yeah i know the grow sisters there's a lot of people you can um, if you need, let me know 
I, I'll definitely tap you for, for those connections. You know, and this industry has some of the best people that, that really are doing the work that are, they're trying to figure out these complex problems and, and trying to, you know, heal themselves probably first. And I think that's all yep. why we all kind of go down this path is for the self healing and, and, um, and the reconnection to what's real. You know, I think every, that's what people want. That, that's what I want. I think, I think people are ready to get off of their phones a little bit and to, and to start tapping into something a little bit more real and maybe cannabis can do that for you. You know, um, I think, I think that it's not for everyone. I think it's important to acknowledge that, but it might, it might be something if you remove the stigma away from the plant that that can really help a lot of people. And, and there's so many, you know, there's CBD, you know, there's the not, there's the raw cannabinoids yeah. there, you know, there's so many ways there's topicals. There's so many ways to use the plant in a holistic way that's non-intoxicating, you know, yeah. that would be AA approved, you know? Um, and then maybe, you know, exploring THC a little bit and maybe not being afraid of what that might have to offer. Cause I think THC is a great teacher. Um, but fascinating stuff, man. I Thanks, Levi. Thanks for having I, me. Yeah, for sure, man. And let's do it again sometime. Cheers. Um, yep. Enjoy Tahoe. Well, enjoy and, the coast. Yep. And uh, yeah, I, I want to smoke some of that Tahoe Afku. That sounds yeah. mighty tasty. <laughs> All right, brother. Until next time. Until next time, bud. All right. Peace. Peace. Thanks for joining me today on Head Change, the podcast that puts you in a better headspace. I've been your host, Levi Strong. Full transcripts of today's episode are available on our blog at awakenedeveryday.com. If you'd like to listen to more podcasts like this, you can join the conversation on Anchor FM and YouTube. Until next time, peace.